Mm. Um, our final panel for the day. And, uh, of course, we have a reception coming up. You want to put that on your calendar. Don't miss that one. That'll be fun. And we'll tell you more about that in just a couple of minutes. We hear a good deal about uh, underserved communities these days. Turns out that there is an underserved uh, issue in our own community, which we will be exploring next in the panel discussion. To lead us in the session is Tony Anderson. Tony is, yeah. Hey, see, hey. Don't even have to tell you anything about him, you know? <laughs> Tony Anderson has been uh, serving people with disabilities for close to 30 years. Twelve of those years, he was the executive director of the ARC of uh, California. And uh, now he is the executive director of the uh, Valley Mountain Regional Center. And Tony will set up the panel and introduce the guest, Tony Anderson. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I know we only have a certain amount of time, and then after this is cocktails. <laughs> so uh, we're in between the program and the cocktail hour. So um, I won't take up too much time. I'm really excited about this particular panel here. And um, and I can go on and on. I, are you my timekeepers in the middle? Ha, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> One hour. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, this panel that we've uh, brought to you today uh, is a, a fabulous panel. We're going to start off, and we're going to hear from DDS, the Department of Developmental Services. They're from the government, and they're here to help, right? <laughs> so we're all here to help. We're all here together. But let me tell you, uh, Rapone Anderson, he's uh, he obviously we're related because I'm Tony Anderson. Uh, but Rapone Anderson is at the, uh, at, at the department. And you probably don't know Rapone, but he has done tremendous work there. He has been spearheading the grant program. Uh, and these are grants that are uh, a year one, they went to the regional centers to begin to address the issue of disparities. Now, about eight years ago, we started to learn that different parts of our community were receiving different portions of services, and they were costing different amounts of money. Now, what, what's going on? And so the easy thing was to say, well, there's a disparity. Uh, most of the money is going to the Caucasians in the state, and the people of color are not getting very much services. The money's not going there which is true. So the, the more important question also then is why? What is really happening? And so uh, the, the grant program that Rapone is heading up digs into that a little further. And then uh, people like Carlos Hernandez here, the, my far right, he's from the Valley Mountain Regional Center, and he is the disparities, he, uh, he's our cultural specialist. So And so then his job was then to begin to find out what we can do to work with our community, learn more, and respond. That's very important, the respond piece. Respond to what we're hearing from the community. See how what we're doing plays out. Is it working? If not, make some changes, make it better. And that's what Carlos does. He's been outreaching, getting out there, learning more on a regular basis, and making adjustments to what he's learning. So you'll hear about what Carlos is doing. And then we've got some fantastic advocates here. Uh, Grace Huerta, another one of our graduates, or par partners, partners in policy making graduates. There's a whole bunch of them here still today. They had investment. Jennifer, Jennifer, Denise, I think there are more. But uh, Grace was, uh, uh, she's always been a fabulous advocate, reaches out to the community and gets people involved. And yeah, it's uh, Oklahoma, right? Is uh, Oklahoma, <laughs> California? Is that where you're from, Oklahoma, California? That's called, otherwise known as Bakersfield. <laughs> and then we get to kick it off with, uh, or not kick it off, we get to uh, round it all up with Mary Lim Lampy. And Mary Lim Lampy has been a community organizer for years. She's, um, she really can get a group moving. Um, but she wasn't originally from our community. She, we, we found her, she found us, and uh, for whatever reason, we told her a compelling enough story, and she got involved, right? And uh, the self-interest connected. That's what. That's how you make powerful movements when your self-interest connects. So you're going to learn um, more from Mary Lim Lampy, and you're going to hear about her passion as well. And then somehow, I'm going to keep our group here within their time frame, and see what I can get away with, right? And uh, and then, but we really want to get your questions because this is a big 
it's a big issue. Um, I, I just noticed too that we didn't bring any white people up, so I'm sorry about that one. <laughs> but we'll we'll find them in our next next time we do it. Um, but we got the Chamorans in the house, my fellow Chamorans. I'm always the only Chamoran in the house, so this time I got a few from Guam. So, all right, brother, sister. All right, so listen up, write down your questions, and get ready to to agitate, right, and then to sort of expand your thinking. So please join me in welcoming my brother, Rapone Anderson. Thank you, Tony, and thank you to the, the ARCA California for inviting me to talk about this important um, subject. Um, Tony is my brother. I'm going to assume that it is from another mother. Uh, but we're all connected in some way, so um, I'm going to get this closer to me. So again, again, thank you. Um, there's many challenges that are happening in our, in our system and disparities within the services that our individuals who um, are accessing um, services in our regional center system is just one of them. Um, but I don't see that any challenge that we have is insurmountable. Um, I think together with you folks in the room and at the state level, the legislature, um, that brighter days are ahead. Um, we've been facing a lot of um, fiscal challenges over the, over the few years, and I think slowly but surely we're starting to get back on track. And um, with your voices and the advocacy of consumers themselves and families, that um, our system is going to be in a better place here. So I just want to take a little bit of time just to talk about what we're doing at a, at a state level. Um, and then I want to leave more time to the folks who are actually doing the work at the, at the local level. Um, let's see if I have this. So just want to give a, just a little overview of the, of the structure. Um, so we have the top, the governor's office, and there's, there's a couple of boxes that are missing here, one being the, the legislature who's, who's setting <laughs> laws that, that we have to uh, abide by. Um, and then I think um, most importantly, below the regional centers are the folks in this room, um, the, the service providers, the, the family advocates, the, the consumer advocates um, that, make our, that make our system run. So um, a few years back, we, um, the legislature passed what's um, known as ABX21, which basically gave an infusion of funding in different areas in our system. But one of the, the main things that it did was provided um, $11 million in, in funding to address inequities in our system. Tony talked about a little bit um, as we look at data, and I'll show a little bit of data in a, in, in a little bit, um, we look and saw for um, a pretty good amount of time that our white consumers um, have a disproportionate more purchase of service per capita than other ethnic groups. And what this $11 million w is, is, is earmarked for is to see what those, those barriers are for, for our different communities, um, what are the challenges, and what type of, of programs and outreach can we do to decrease that, that gap, um, with the goal being that every individual, every individual with a developmental disability in the state has equal access to the services that, that we provide. Regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of the language you speak, everyone needs to have equal access. So um, 1617, fiscal year 17, 1617 was the first year that the eleven million dollars was uh, was available, um, and it was only available to regional centers. So regional centers um, had to submit to the state um, proposals of how they were going to um, propose to spend this money in their local communities. So uh, within their catchment areas, what could they do to reduce um, disparities? Um, one thing that that's already was already in statute is regional centers are required every year. Um, and right now, <laughs> during this month, you're having a lot of meetings um, with their local community, but they have to present their data, their local data, purchase service data to their community and talk about where they see disparities and they need to report back to the state a plan to reduce those inequities. Um, 
we have in the last two years, the state ourselves went out into, into the state, into the different communities, and heard what families had to say, what consumers had to say. Um, and I think, and it's, it's not in, in our system, but in a lot of systems in, 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 in America, is that we take a few things and we assume a couple of things. One, that most people speak English. And secondly, that they have some basic understanding of the system that they're entering. And we found that's not the case. Um, and those are the misnomers that we have to, have to um, break down, not only in our system, but in, in other systems, that people are coming into our system who don't have a basic understanding of the services we provide, how to enter the system, how to get their children, their family members assessed for disabilities, how to ask for services, how to advocate for themselves. And we can't lo any longer assume that that's the case. So what we did is um, we granted 98 projects across the state to, to the 21 regional centers um, for them to begin implementing programs um, to reduce the disparities. And what we saw was a lot of programs um, having to do with, with language access, with um, cultural competency training. A lot of regional centers were um, training their own staff to, um, to be more understanding, more acceptable of, of different um, cultures and ethnic groups that are going to be approaching them at the regional centers. Um, a lot of education. Um, but I think the, the, the biggest thing that happened the following year is we opened the door to community-based organizations. And the first year, we, we had $11 million, and we actually gave out, I would say, maybe $9 million initially, and then we had to go back out to regional centers and say, hey, do you have other, other projects? We, we still have another million dollars left um, to address this issue. And, and they did, and, and, we, and we ended up allocating the full $11 million. Um, this year was a different story. Um, we included CBOs, and I like to say the CBOs brought their A game. They, they came and they said, we are, we're in the trenches. You know, these are, these are parents, these are family members, and they say we know what the issues are, we know what, what we need, we know what our, our, our family members need, and we ended up having over $25 million in proposals for the $11 million. So it was a, a, a tough task for us, um, but we, uh, we whittled it down, and as, as hard as it was, it was, a, um, it was an effort of the hearts for us to read through each one of those proposals and see what, see what these different communities were proposing um, and, and them verbalizing what they needed from our system um, was, uh, was remarkable, to be honest with you. So I just wanted to show you a little bit of, a little bit of data. So in 2006, um, as you can see, our, our caseload has, has grown considerably. It's increased by over 40% since 2006 to 2016. And during that time, um, whites were, were the majority in our consumer caseload. In 2016, um, Hispanics became the, the most represented ethnic group in our caseload. So in 2006, whites represented 41.6% of the, of the consumer caseload. Um, in 2016, they represented 33%, and Hispanics represented 37%. And that's an increase of 5% for Hispanics and a decrease of about 8% for, for whites. So our system is changing as our state is changing, which is requiring us to change as, as well. And this is just a little bit of look into, into the numbers. A lot of folks, we've been talking about this for a few years, so this is not a, a surprise to, to many, but um, you can see that the, the average per capita um, expenditures for, for whites are more than double than Hispanics. Um, in 2000, this is fiscal year 15, 16 data, you can see that um, the average per capita expenditures for, for whites was about $20,000, whereas for Hispanic Latino, they were approximately 9,500. So there's a little bit of a disparity there and, and a gap we, we need to close and we need to understand why that is. And, and, and there's many factors. I don't think there's, there's um, just one um, solution and there's definitely not one reason why this exists. 
Um, we have heard many things. We've heard from um, certain ethnic groups, fear of government. Um, they're afraid to bring their family members in because they're s scared that um, ICE may be knocking on their door the next, the next day. Um, we've heard that there's cultural differences in that certain ethnic groups like to keep their family members at home. Um, and we've heard that our system is difficult to understand, is difficult to navigate, um, and that certain ethnic groups just take no for an answer and others don't. And they have the resources and they have the money and they have the backing to fight. Um, I work at the department and hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but uh, we have families who um, beat down our doors until they hear the, until they hear the word yes. And I will say that most of the time they're not um, non-white, and and I think some of our families are they're afraid they're afraid of the system, and um, in different cultures when 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 authority tells you tells you no, um, then you you accept that, and we know that um, regional center staff are doing the best they can, um, but sometimes you have to advocate harder and harder for, for, your for your child or as a consumer for, for yourself. Um, we have a, a fair hearing system um, and that's scary to folks. You know, a lot of times, you know, they'll, you know, a uh, regional center will say, um, this service is not available to you. We'll give you a, a notice of, of action and you can go to a fair hearing. Um, a lot of folks aren't gonna do that. They're, they, they hear the, this is a, a, a legal process. Um, and not that there's anything wrong with that process, but that process is intimidating to, to a lot of folks. And so we need to, to find ways to, to um, meet people at the door, listen to their needs, and hopefully um, provide services that, that folks need without having to, to fight. <coughs> this is an another slide that shows the, the different variants, and this is by language. So the first slide was by ethnicity, this is by language, and as you can see that English speakers, Korean speakers have a, um, a higher, higher per capita than, than Spanish and Hmong speaking. And again, it's, it's almost double. And this is just a little bit of the, the timeline of, of what occurred with, the, with our $11 million. So we, there are some, some timelines that are set in statute. Um, and it's been nonstop for the last two years. Um, like I said, it's, it's been um, tough for us at the department in, in reviewing all the proposals, but at the same time, it's been, it's been exciting because um, I'm sure that soon we're gonna see the needle move. And that's our, our goal is to, um, and, and, and the impact of, and, and a lot of times we talk to the legislature and they wanna see, they wanna see data, they wanna see numbers. But we know that that impact is being made by regional center staff, by you all in this room, um, and it's not gonna be shown out in the numbers. It's going to, it's gonna be an individual feeling more empowered to go to, to a regional center and ask for services. Um, it's gonna be some of those little smaller things being more educated, um, a parent um, feeling more, more knowledgeable about um, the needs of, the, of their child and, and what to ask for. So we wanna see the numbers change, but a lot of the efforts that are, that are being um, implemented are not gonna always bear out in the numbers. And this is just wanted to show you a quick, this is our review process. So we, um, as I mentioned, we had um, a hundred, just 140 proposals totaling $25 um, million. And we, we worked, we wanted an objective review of, the, of these proposals. So we brought in the Department of Rehab. We also brought in um, DRC, Disability Rights California, to help us um, evaluate. Um, the proposals were, were, we scored them to 100, and they were so good, we, we couldn't go below 85 to, to get to the $11 million. Um, and we took in a lot of factors. We made sure that, that the, the programs were spread equally ge geographically. Um, also, that there was not a lot of duplication. There's a lot of similar programs, and I'm sure they're, they're all, they're all um, um, looking to, to, to accomplish some similar goals. We wanted to make sure that each ethnic group was covered, um, geographical area, and that regional centers themselves had an, um, an equitable amount of funds to, to work with. 
this again, showing a little bit more of a breakdown. We had um, about $16 million um, that were proposed came from community-based organizations, and the rest were from regional centers. And then when we allocated the $11 million, we had about $123. So if somebody wants a check, I can write you a $123 check <laughs> out of the $11 million bucks. Um, that'll pay for Tony's drinks tonight, sure. <laughs> So of that, we $7.3 million um, went to CBOs and about 3.7 3 went to regional centers. And this is just a, a breakdown of the regional, just the, the, the ethnicity and, and languages that are covered with the, with the projects that were approved for the $11 million. And those you see in, in a darker blue um, on the right-hand side are, are new languages or ethnicities that weren't addressed during the first year of, of funding. Right. And this is just a di distribution of funding throughout the state. Like I said, we really looked at, um, geographically to ensure that the state was covered. And, and this just happened on the, on the natural that when we approved um, the, the projects, it mirrored our population um, in the in the state, um, Northern California only two percent difference. Central California within within five percent, and so just by us reviewing the projects and, and our using our criteria, um, the projects and the funding were distrib distributed the way our consumer population was. And just as a quick um, chart showing the type of programs that that we approve. Um, outreach, education, and promotors. Promotors being those trusted individuals in the community and, and a liaison between um, a community and, and the regional center um, to help um, those families advocate for themselves. And just wanted to say that, that these projects are approved, but we are gonna be diligent about ensuring that they are effective. Um, we are monitoring each and every program, and if they aren't working, we're going to look to use the funds in some other way. So we have quarterly reporting that's, that's occurring. That's going to happen. The first, uh, first report is due in July of this year. Um, and we are going to look at qualitative and quantitative measures and ensure that um, the funding is, is going to the right place. And if not, there's other programs out there I'm sure that could, could use that funding and make an impact. Um, and this is just showing our, our schedule for this year. We're going to we're already starting the guidelines for fiscal year 18-19 funding, um, and uh, we'll repeat it all over again, and hopefully the legislature keeps this funding in the budget, and hopefully it can continue because we see the good work and the impact it's having already in the in communities. And that was it. So now I just want to turn it over to, oh, thank you. We're going to do the questions at the very end, so make sure that we have time. You guys are lucky I had those 50 pages of stats. Oh, my goodness. So because of time. Which way? Okay, everybody. Hello, my name is Carlos Fernandez and I'm the cultural specialist at Valley Mountain Regional Center. We are in, we have three branches. We're in Modesto, or we're in Stockton, California. I'm sure you guys have heard of Stockton. Um, we also cover five counties, okay? Okay, okay. Today, uh, since we're short on time, I'm gonna be talking on the most important points. I'm gonna skip a few stats. Uh, just because uh, Mr. Rapone already covered uh, some of it. A uh, little story about me and why this is so important to me and so I'm very passionate about this. Um, like I mentioned, I am the cultural specialist and I am working with families around our community uh, to help them develop tools to 
advocate for themselves. Um, the reason why advocating is a, bu it's, it's a great word, but I think it's time for our parents to get agitated. I think it's time for our parents to start standing up and start speaking for themselves. And the reason I say that is because, uh, real quick, uh, my family, I have a brother who is a client. So I have a, a, a one of my siblings is a individual with developmental disability. Um, I grew up in that Latino family where my parents were scared of everything. My parents were scared of coming to the regional center and asking for services. They didn't want people thinking, oh, you know, um, let's not let's not abuse the system. Let's let people that have that are more in need, um, you know. Uh, receive these services. Well, I was a 10 year old stuck with a brother who was six years old and had uh, disabilities and, and behaviors. And uh, so I had, a con you know, I didn't know about containments, but I lived that life where my parents wouldn't trust anybody in the community to watch us. So I, as a 10 year old, I was taking care of my three siblings uh, and one with disability. So that story, stories are very important because I get to share that with my community. Um, as I was mentioning, um, so with that being said, I'm going to touch on these uh, next uh, areas here. Uh, we're going to talk about the community outreach that we're doing at, re at the regional center. We're going to ta talk about training and person-centered uh, thinking and planning that we are offering to the staff. We're going to talk about uh, simplifying and translating all documents. And uh, right on. And uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about internal cultural personnel, okay? VMRC believes that it's not only important that we speak the same language, but like again I said, that story, that we have experiences serving, in, uh, serving as advocates, integrators, or educators, and that we get to each share with these families so we can build that gap and build trust in the community. Who are we? We are the, uh, the region Valley Mountain Regional Center. We're one of the 21 regional centers here in California. We serve the pro uh, approximately 14,000 individuals, okay? We serve five counties, San Joaquin County, Stanislaus, Amador, Calaveras, and Tuolumne County. Um, our POS, our purchase of service, was $178 million for the year six, uh, 16 and 17, or 17, I'm sorry. And we have approximately 293 service coordinators at the regional center. Uh, now we're going to look at who we serve and ethnicities. So the ethnicity of VMRC's catchment population, as our census says here, Caucasian is 45% and the Hispanic is 37%. Uh, Asian community is a small community, but it's it's a community that is in need. Right now we have the Hmong community, the Vietnamese community, and they are a closed community where not just anyone can walk in. So right now we're working with uh, an agency, uh, Hope Esperanza, that comes from um, uh, Gamaliel, California. And we are finding ways to, to get into these communities, to help, to let them know that, hey, we are here because everybody that we go out to when we speak, they think that we are, and everybody knows this, they think that we are, that we get something from their kids receiving services or we get extra money, and that's not the case. We all know that. We do this because we enjoy what we do. We want to help. We want to help their ch siblings or brothers or sisters, and that's what I think of. I think of my family when I go out there in the community and think, man, my mom back in 88, 89 was struggling where were these programs back in the day for my mom where no, but we didn't have any help. We were a family who, uh, I'm Salvadoran and my dad is that proud Latino man who says, oh no, 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 no. Whatever this autism is, it's gonna go away by itself. Okay, <laughs> that was my dad. Okay. Um, I put this here, the ethnicity of person served at VMRC. I put Guami, Guam for Tony here, we <laughs> serve one family. And as you can see, the Caucasian and Latinos are two of our prominent uh, ethnicities that we serve. Uh, ethnicity of VMRC service coordinators, we have 47% are Caucasian, 25% are Latinos, and 14% are Asian, okay? 
we have some covered that. Ethnicity of persons served by VMRC living at home with families. As you can see here, um, the Latino community is 90.2%. The Caucasian is 60%, which means what? That's all right. So a lot of the Latino community, uh, some of you know, they believe that we will take care of our own. We will let our children live at the home till they're, my dad said, hey, you can stay till you're 50. No, thank you. I'm joining the Air Force and I'm leaving. But it was great, it was great. So that's what we are, the data is showing. Um, the, primar the primary language that we serve um, English is the highest, of course. Um, let's see here. Okay. English, we're at 11,281 individuals. Okay. The Latinos, we are 1,975. Okay. So we serve a, a, a fairly good amount of, you know, people that speak Spanish, and we serve, and that's not the full number. Like I said, I have families that come to the regional center. And they don't want to provide any information. Okay, when you ask them where are you from, oh, I'm, I don't want to state that. Or I had a family that came because they're so scared right now. Um, in Modesto, we have Friday nights where they do ISIS pickups um, in one of the predominant Latino community uh, neighborhoods. So every Friday night, you'll see a, um, a checkpoint with a big old bus there just picking, picking the community up. So families are scared. Families are not wanting us service coordinators to attend their homes and do IPP. They don't want us to, they don't want to come into our regional center. So we have to meet them somewhere in public, somewhere where they feel that, hey, nothing's gonna happen here. That's what we're dealing with right now. And we know that their children need services. So what do we do about that? So, what's that? And ISIS, ISIS basically is a department of uh, uh, immig it's like Im immigration picking them up. Just, yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. So, it's ICE, right. Um, did I say ISIS? I'm <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's apostrophe S. <laughs> I was talking about many. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, so <laughs> wow, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> they are terrorists. <laughs> 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 That's right. Yeah, there we go. So the funding um, came out 2016, and Mr. Rapone and his staff put out this ABX 2-1, and the, our regional center decided, hey, let's let's apply for this. Let's apply for some grants. I wrote the grants. Thank you, Mr. Rapone, for giving me such extensive grants. Right. Um, so we were concentrating on the following items, cultural competency for the staff, promotora project, translation of documents like I mentioned earlier, and community outreach, okay? Cultural competency, I'm not gonna go through all this, but I'm gonna tell you why this is, I thought about this. When I was training as a service coordinator, I went out with one of my super, uh, supervisors, and it was a Latino home, and we went in to the home, and this supervisor decided not to sit down and to do the IPP standing up for an hour. Okay, yeah. Just because the house was a little messy, they went in and didn't, did not sit down. So they just stood up and said, oh no, no, I'd rather stand. Well, I, I sat, okay, because I know in any home, not only a Caucasian home, but it's a respect, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a courtesy. I'm like, sure, I'm, I'm here at your home. If you don't want to drink water, take the cup, put it to the side, and keep writing, okay? So there's tactics. There's a lot of ways. So that was one of the reasons why I thought, you know what? Not only do we need to train or, or inform our community, but within our, com or our organization, we need to train our staff. We need to teach them, hey, people are people. They will know that, and we're trying to, you know, we're complaining that, oh, well, our families aren't coming now. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that they have somebody who, who's not being culturally sensitive and, and 
stands the whole time while they're at the house and doesn't take any water or even if it's bottled or okay um so let me move on here the promotora project we talked about earlier the promotora is very important to us uh the promotora like uh, mr rapon mentioned is basically promotoras out in the community that are building trust with our families but not only within the promotora in the family but with the service coordinator like I mentioned, that lady didn't sit down. That probably severed that relationship there. Okay, so we want to train our families to hey, the regional here center is here to help. Let's let's take whatever services they're offering. Let's let's work with them as a team. Um, let's see here. Okay, so like I mentioned, we're building relationships with the promotora and the service coordinator. Um, right now, we have uh, the through the Promotora, the Promotora has helped us build a community team in Tracy, California of 40 families, which this is unbelievable. These moms are agitated, they're tired, they are mad, and that's the families that we were looking for. We wanted families to start questioning, to start fighting for each other, and nobody can teach a parent better than another person, yes. another parent that's going through the same same issues okay and that's one of the concentrations where I'm very passionate about um, like I said I share I know it gets very personal but I took this leadership training through Gamaliel and it opened my eyes um, before I was very private working at the, at the regional center I was very private about my brother being an individual with uh, disabilities um, and not that there's nothing wrong with it but it's my business but I noticed going through this leadership training that hey people are gonna find this useful they're gonna find out what my parents went through in the 80s with somebody like this and that's what drives me thinking about my brother now who's uh, 30 years old has a job is engaged he's he's living a good life and that's something that I share with families um, translation of documents families are giving IPPs cover pages in English they don't know what that means they don't they, they have no clue they're going by what we say and what translators say. And to tell you the truth, that's another thing. People are uh, hiring translators without them being tested. I've been to so many schools where the translator is half, 60% of the time. Has yeah. makes no sense what they're saying. And that's one of the issues that we are addressing at the regional center. We are starting to test because, uh, yeah, I mean, anybody can say that they speak Spanish. We have, you know, we all know that there's two types of English. There's your urban, which I sometimes speak, right? And then there's your English. So that's, that's the type of Spanish that we have. We have slang Spanish, and we have your traditional Spanish, which is your professional Spanish, okay? And um, so we are translating all these documents, uh, trying to get with parents and let them know that, hey, these parents, we want you to understand. There's no secrets. There's nothing that we need to hide. Please review these, these, these papers in your own language. The cultural event. Okay, so September 30th, we had a cultural event. We were, um, we were kind of expecting 300 to 400 people. We were like, yeah, if we have 300 to 400, it's going to be the best. I want it to be fun. Most importantly, I wanted it to be fun and informational. The only reason why I'm saying that is because, and I'm going to be completely honest with you, if I go to booths and I see a paragraph, like a pamphlet, and it's like two, like uh, three pages long, I will not read it. I will talk to you and whatever information you give, uh, and it's the truth. Our parents are not going to read that pamphlet. And that's why I, um, we had this cultural event. So we were thinking, okay, well, how are we going to attract all these Latinos? How are we going to attract the whole community? And not just leave people out but remember there's a disparity so we can't just have a whole bunch of caucasians there because i mean it's going to keep being a despair <laughs> right <laughs> so so we thought you know what let's go ahead and, and we actually hired three attorneys to help and consult okay and it worked out we had over oh that's our flyer by the way english and spanish sorry and here are a few stats. We had 600 in attendance. We had 213, thank you. We had 213 consumers. 
uh, individuals. We had 150 guests that walked in. We had f over 40 vendors, and the vendors that we had actually served a purpose. It wasn't just, you know, just a vendor that offers. It was vendors that we actually use so uh, for services. But look at this here. You see the paddy wagon? I made the mistake to putting it next to the uh, immigration booth. <laughs> yeah, you see that? That wasn't, yeah. I, I know, I know. Get good help. <laughs> but it worked out. We have, four f we have f over 45 families that we're helping out with immigration services and consul consultations. And uh, here are a few pictures. Sorry, I'm going so fast. Um, but my time is up. And that's my kid with the uh, clown there at the cultural event. So we're out there in the community. We're working with these uh, uh, families. And uh, we're building that trust in the community so they can come to us. But more importantly, we're taking workshops to them. Okay? Thank you, guys. Sorry it was so rushed. Buenas tardes. Estoy muy contenta de estar aquí en el, en el condado de Sacramento. I know you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> Very happy. You guys got it. Okay. Uh, right now we're getting ready to get, okay. Okay. I think we can get started. And I know we're, we're running out of time, but I'm going to try to go. Okay. Which way do I take? Do I take? Okay. Technical challenge, but that's okay. All right, who we are. Okay, let me start with, I think it's easier for me to do here. Maybe not the, the middle. Okay, who we are. I think it's, I figure it's easier for me to read here. Okay, um, Exceptional Family Center, my name is Grace Huerta, and, and thank you so much for inviting me, and I stand here proudly first as a mother, a mother of two uh, young adult children, and any t every time I get asked to speak, the, my first and foremost pride and joy is uh, siendo una madre de dos hijos, a mother, and I try to always um, bring that to, to the table, is to do your very best. ARC does a great job inviting parents, and I really appreciate the work of the ARC. And also Exceptional Family Center, is, um, I've got to update the slide. We also are an ARC chapter, very proudly so. But uh, yes, thank you. And one day we'll update it and get all that the logos going. And um, our vision is to be a lead provider of by assisting families to access key, key resources, identifying and overcoming the cultural characteristics that oh, can read this characteristics that impede families from obtaining resources. And that was really the beginning, even before disparity. Disparity really isn't anything new. We know for the past many years, disparity is something that um, the state of California has had to deal with, but but now it's becoming, um, it's open, and it's a really good opportunity now for the rest who are advocating is to make sure we work together to, to close that disparity gap. So let's see. I wonder if I can redo this slide. Yeah. Let's see if I want. Is it? Okay. Okay. Uh, the problem, there's something again. Who we are. It's not coming through. It's not doing. I'm having Tony do it, so it's not really my fault. Tony, yeah, you, you doing it? <laughs> Come on, Tony. I thought it was me at first. You got it? No, it went to the it went to the last page. So, but while while we figure that out, uh, one of the things that um, that uh, about I would say about a year ago, I was contacted by our rock stars, uh, Mary Gonzalez, Tim Hordbecker from the Ark and uh, the Vietnamese Association, the Koreans, and to, to talk about form a coalition. So it's very exciting. It's called the Justice and Equity Coalition. And um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But first, um, okay, is that what we want? No, we'll, let's, stick, let's stick to that. What's on the screen? This one? Okay, so the terms, and one of the things that the, um, just I would I like to update um, the audience about what we're doing with the Justice and Equity Coalition. 
and our last training on February 3rd, one of the things that, uh, that was sh shared um, by Dr. Barbara Wheeler, one of our coalition members from, um, she's from the USC uh, Department of, of Excellency, and um, she said one of the things that we really need to do as um, parent to parent is as we look at uh, disparity is to inform the parents what are the terms that they need to know and so one of the things that we share with the parents uh, for the different ethnic groups that day where we need to know what does it mean uh, when you look at at the data because the data isn't always very easy to understand many of you are used to data but parents who are, who are trying to be part of this solution with disparity uh, what we talked about was what, what do we mean by consumer count so we, we, d we explain what consumer count means, race and, and ethnicity, what are the, what are the different ethnicities um, that have been um, identified. Um, purchase of service, we take it for granted, a lot of people when they talk purchase of service, uh, there's a difference when you say authorized, expenditures, utilized, and number of purchases, so we broke it down. So I don't need to do that here because we'll take too much time, what each mean. So that was very helpful to the different, they really appreciated the parents who were there that we explain when they look at the data what that means. And again, again, language, and we explain the age, the how the data broke it down to all ages, three to 21, 22 to older. What does it mean by average versus variance from the average, total versus per capita? And there was a lot of interest, believe it or not. It, was, it, it seemed like overwhelming when you don't know this, but it's so important for us parents to know exactly what that means. Okay, does it change it? Thank you, Tony, putting you to work. So did, did it change? Yeah. Okay. So here, and I would like to talk about a little bit about current counting. And when I was at the Justice and um, Equity Coalition meeting, um, when they found out I was there, they said, Brace, are you from Kern County? Have you looked at the numbers? I mean, the numbers across the street is really alarming. But really, Kern County, we're looking at uh, numbers that are very, very, um, you know, the parents are saying, no, we need to do something about this. And uh, the last data report, from um, DDS showed that ages 22 years and older in Kern County is very huge. Uh, compared to, let's say, uh, Hispanic, $20,565 were spent compared to white, 31817 Even my white brothers and sisters are saying, do you guys know that this is, you know, we, this is very alarming and, uh, and we're ready to do something about that to see how we can work together with the very system who says, yes, we want to work together with the various uh, co community groups. And then when we looked at the, next one is three. When we looked at the three to 21 years per capita, again, you look at the data 20 in t um, the year two 2016, 2017, Hispanic $4,890 were spent compared to 8,703. So yes, uh, at the Justice and, uh, you know, equity coalition we were like okay th the numbers tell not the whole story but we know that the system is not working something is wrong and a lot of it is uh systemic we that's what we believe so comparison by race the question which is that okay comparison by race so the question, do regional center clients from Asian, Hispanic, and black groups get the same services as white clients? Obviously, the data. Uh, well, can I skip the next one? So if you look at the next data. So we look at the next slide. This was, pr this was presented at our last meeting and again, you could see that per capita expenditures by ethnicity and race, white is very high, 33%, uh, compared to Hispanic, 11,000. And then you look at the other slide where it says, um, you can just tell by the graph. Uh, I mean, we've been talking about data, and data is important because it does tell us that we have a problem here, and the problem has to be addressed. And um, so I'm happy that the ARC is, is really going to, is on board. To um, to really join uh, this coalition, so that we can make sure that the regional centers, well, not just our regional center, but DDS, are held accountable, and that the the outcomes of this money that's being uh, spent and allocated uh, towards disparity is going to be 
the outcomes are going to really change this. So the next slide. Okay. All right, we got it. Yeah. So does it make difference if your child is still in school or an adult? How many educators can answer? It does make, right? I mean, there's any, where's the edu any educators here still? Oh, there you go. Does it make a difference? Why? Right, and again, um, in attending many IEP meetings with parents, um, the school districts, uh, when they're in school, have to provide the services, whether it's speech, occupational therapy, um, and but the parents, are, it's, it's a battle between getting the, the regional center and the school district to, to spend that money that the, that the, that the student needs or the s for the services, because the system, the regional center system is the payer of last resort, and uh, as parents were being told that generic, we need to utilize generic services first. So um, again, the school districts must provide, and that is something that is an ongoing situation because we can go to the IPPs, parents feel that they're being denied services because their child is in school. So it's one of those things that as parents, we have to learn to become more knowledgeable in terms of when, you're s when your child is in school or whether w once they're aged out, it changes. So does that? Uh, Five minutes. Okay, I'll go faster. Let's go through. We can skip. We can skip that. We al we talked about. We talked. Carlos talked a little bit about language language matters. So this is what. But I really want to jump to this. What do Latino parents say? Okay, there we go. So in the survey, this is really. This is what I really, really want to make sure that we talk. Ab that we inform the audience today. What did the what What did Latino parents say? In terms of disparity, they said number one, more services for their children, but they don't know what's possible. So they need the service coordinator to really educate them as to what is possible so that they can um, request the services that they need. They want more information on services they can get, more quality vendors, in general, more vendors who are culturally responsive, better services for the adult children 25 years and older. Service coordinators to be better trained. They don't know enough to help families understand what they need to know about regional centers and what their children can get that will help them. And also information on what the RC is doing to address disparities, information on how uh, POS money is spent by the regional centers um, and can be used in different ways to better meet their needs. And I just wanted to add uh, a recent um, situation came up at our family center where we have a Spanish conference um, next month, April 14th. And uh, we've, all, we've been told that there's a cap so right now we're talking to our, our regional center. We have a new director. We hope that the cap will be lifted because we don't understand why are you going to put a cap on a conference. So again, there there are challenges within the system. Uh, there is an educational fund that parents have, and they want to be able. They want they want the right to be able to utilize that fund. So we're, we continue to to do that. I also wanted to add real quickly. Uh, what did Chinese? Okay, real quickly. Two minutes. Chinese parents. I really love this coalition because we have different ethnicities. And what did the, chi uh, the Chinese parents say? I don't know if I'm it. Uh, I'll, I'll continue talking. Okay. Uh, the Chinese parents said, it is difficult to navigate the system and access services. Materials translated into Chinese are not translated well. Families do not know what services are available to them for their children, and case coordinators do not inform them of services. We need more information and resources on housing for adult consumers cultural barriers in communicating their needs to RC vendors. Service coordinators do not take time to explain service contracts and implications for the service families will be receiving. There is a gap in families accessing approved services because families have difficulty finding and getting to bilingual service vendors. RC staff, regional center staff, are not referring new Chinese families to our organization for parent-to-parent -parent education, advocacy, and support. So as you can see, we have a lot of work to go, but you know, here we are today. It's a it's it's a start, and, uh, and I know DDS is here. Thank you, and for all the work. And I want to, I'll and a uh, plug for our Mr. Jim Baldwin from Bark, who is oh. is con <laughs> contributing to our conference. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate that. And to Ames Homes here in Kern County, an awesome power group. Thank you for being here, Eman and her group. Thank you.
going to go ahead and introduce myself. There we go. Mary Lynn Lambie. I'm waiting a minute. Okay. Mary Lynn Lampy, I am the executive director of Genesis. Uh, Genesis is a V Gamaliel affiliate located in Oakland, California. And so um, I'm, I'm really just really honored and excited to be up here, um, especially to be the person between you and the cocktails. Okay, so um, we are a um, we are a membership organization, and so here are our members. So an institution becomes, they make a decision as a group, um, which is a small miracle in itself, and they decide to become a member of Genesis, and usually they become a member of Genesis because they are tired of watching their values violated every single day in our policies and our laws in our communities. So a few years ago, the Arc of Alameda County became a member of Genesis. And for us um, in community organizing, especially faith-based community organizing, that, was, that blew our minds because we had not had a lot of experience with disability service organizations um, wanting to really have anything to do with us. Um, but what we had found out was that we had people like Tim Hornbecker and Tony who had sat in a room just like this and were called poverty pimps and called names by Greg. And Mary was in something where she ripped up a mission of all of you all and that was enough for the leadership of the Arc of Alameda County to have the vision that they had to do something uh, different. And I know we always make jokes about uh, how you know there just needs to be some disruption in the thinking of our people. But what really brought the Arc of Alameda County into membership of Genesis was the love of uh, the leadership of their people. It really was about love because they were sick of their people um, being afraid of what was going to happen when their aging parents died. They were sick of the of the having to go to the legislator and beg for crumbs. They were sick of that. So they came in because they love our people. Genesis organizes around issues. And so we have, uh, the first issue is disrupting the school to prison pipeline. I'm just like Carlos. I wanted to find a way to get a picture of my kid on a slide, so that is yeah. my kid. So. <laughs> Dis disrupting the school to prison pipeline is exactly what it sounds like. It is interrupting this equation where black and brown kids, because of our policies, end up in jail. Our second issue is around transit for youth. We are the organization that put $15 million towards a free youth bus pass in Oakland, California. 9,000 bus passes <laughs> have been given to you. Because we are a membership organization, and like I said, it is a small miracle that organizations decide, make a decision together, we also want to model for our organizations how a collective can make a decision together. So these issues came up from the people through a process of listening to each other. Can you imagine that? That meant that people had to turn to each other and listen to each other. It was really revolutionary for a lot of people. W when we were deciding about our disability issue, we had a room just like this. We were expecting 100 people, and it was from all of our members, and we were voting on about nine different issues. And so the competition was fierce, but we are a people who believe in the grassroots. So we were like, whatever the process happens, happens. Every member was challenged to bring as many members as they could, many leaders as they could, because every leader got three votes. So the more pe people you brought, the more people could get behind your issue. So I'm gonna shout out to Tim, uh, organize the most number of people, because the one thing about people in the disability community is that you all ha usually have a posse. Like usually if you have someone who has a disability, they often need a caregiver, and they often need a driver, and all of those people got votes. <laughs> so one of our leaders from the church said to me, 
but this isn't fair because a lot of these people don't, they're only here to vote. They're not here for anything else but voting. And I said, listen, that's called good organizing. That he knew the self-interest of the people for this to become an issue, and that's how it became an issue. So here is how you know that I'm a Gamaliel organizer, and I swear to God we did not plan this. Greg and I, uh, I, take, I, I take a lot of uh, direction from Greg because the playbook that we use in organizing, he literally wrote it. Like literally, there's notes, like literally from him. So I have three Ps for my Ps. Um, one is power, two is people, and three is patience. You already know about the definition of power, which is the ability to act. So we look at our people when we are discussing the disability issue, of like who is willing to actually do something. You already know why people don't want to do stuff. They're confused about power. They see people in power as being abusive and they don't want to be that way. It implies responsibility, but they use powerless as a tactic. And so when we're looking at a group like this, one thing we know is that there's about 10% of you that will actually do something. And the rest will maybe get back on Netflix or Facebook or navel gazing, and they will hope that those 10% actually do, they will hope for them. Maybe they will pray for them. But they won't actually do anything. And of the 10% that actually do something, a lot of it will involve you know, change.org petitions. Nothing against change.org or petitions. But a lot of it will be very passive. We are calling people to something where they actually have to put their body out there and stand in power. I mean, it's no small thing. So when I talk about people, we knew with this issue it had to be a broad base. We had to have people with disabilities who had different experiences the people who love them, and the people who believe that they are able-bodied. We had to get people across, this is our organizing 101, across racial, denominational, geographic, economic lines. It needs to be intergenerational. I brought a student with me, and I have a feeling she's the youngest person in this room. I can probably, like, I'm not making any judgments. I'm not looking at anyone but I'm pretty sure she is the youngest person in this room. We need to make sure a lot of these policies involve young people, and often we forget to invite them to things like this. And often they are very adulty spaces. This is a very adult-centered space. We need to make sure that we're bringing everyone to the table to do something, some action, because nobody wants to meet to meet or just hear reports. My last P is patience. Um, ableism runs really deep in our culture. When we started working with people with disabilities, just in my organizing, we had to realize that, uh, so for example, we had a meeting and every meeting we always do a debrief or an evaluation of how the meeting went. And one of our people said, uh, because one of our leaders has a speech impediment, that sometimes she could not understand what she was saying, the woman with the speech impediment. And I said, why did you wait 90 minutes to the end of the meeting to mention this? And she just didn't have an answer, and I'll tell you why. You know why. She didn't think that she had anything to say. So my agitation is, boy, if it's really a kingdom that we're building here, and that's a very faith term, if we're really building a beloved community, that means that you needed to say like 90 minutes ago that I don't always understand what you're saying and can we figure out a strategy. So you better believe in a Genesis meeting that that does not happen. It's either all of us or none of us, right? Education is key, but I've been talking to Mary all day and Greg most of the day, and so I'm changing the last P to being pissed off. <laughs> I, I've been listening to this panel and I, I just love, I love that we're bringing up this issue and it is time for this issue, but California 
has the largest number of immigrants and non-English speaking people in this country. This, I believe there are 27% of our population is immigrants. And with all due respect, how did we not plan a system and a structure <laughs> to account for the fact that we might need to make sure that Spanish is spoken? How did that happen? I'll tell you how. It's called systematic racism. That's what it is. There are people who are benefiting, and there are people who are not. And I know that you all, you seem like perfectly nice people. <laughs> I mean, until you prove otherwise. You seem like personally reasonable people. I, I just, I think that there are times, though, that we need to just free ourselves to just being okay with being angry. It is an appropriate response to our values being violated. I know that we are conditioned as people not to do that. The reason that we are just listening and thinking about like the stats and all the reasonable solutions of how we fix this problem is because we've been conditioned to be very nice people. What we are asking all of you is to get pissed off and make change. I mean, that is how most of history has been changed, isn't it? Our network is having a statewide training in June, June 17th through the 23rd, right, Mary? In Turlock, California. There, there are people I know in this room who, because of that leadership training, their anger was unleashed in a good way. I'm just wondering if there's anyone in this room who wants that for their people, for their children. I know I want that. I want that for you. When I look at a room like this, I think, how many potential warriors are in this room? So my last thing is just, I love to quote Frederick Douglass. Does anyone know who that is? Yeah. <laughs> still, are we still? T yeah. Okay, heads up. He is no longer with us. He has died. Okay. Uh, he is an abolitionist. And uh, one of the quotes that we always use is that power concedes nothing without a demand. So Mr. Rapone, I just have to say, you seem like a perfectly nice man. I'm hoping that I become like a pain in your ass. That would be like fourth P. <laughs> I want my people to be a pain in your ass. <laughs> Power concedes nothing without a demand. Never has, never will. There's no other way to upset the system other than just turning it upside down and turning it on its head. That's how we make change. Well, I hope that provokes some deep thought, and there's a lot of questions, and uh, time's up. Got to go. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Mr. Anderson. Got a couple of minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hope you can handle the answers. We hope you can handle the questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Let me talk to her. <laughs> so, Okay. First question is, how do the numbers break down for per capita spending for rural versus um, compared to urban? Oh, rural versus urban. Do you, anybody have that offhand? We, we do have it, but none of I, I just, qu just quickly, there, there are, are two disparities in the system, and one is by race and one is by region. Definitely, if you look at um, a San Francisco Golden Gate Regional Center versus um, Valley Mountain, Golden Gate Regional Center, I believe, is getting per person spending twice as much versus many other regional centers. So there's definitely a regional disparity, and you can assume why some of those disparities exist within regions as well as a racial disparity. I didn't tell him to say <laughs> That's true. Anything else? Oh, yeah. I hear you this none. one's for you. No, no, this <laughs> is for you. Um, <laughs> we saw statistics on p um, the people 
uh, Valley Mountain Regional Center supports and its staff, but what about the Regional Center Board of Directors? Do you see the Regional Center e examining the diversity of their boards as a reflection of the makeup of their community? Oh, yes, um, and that's one of the things that we have to, each Regional Center has to go through a process of uh, uh, making sure that they're reflective uh, of their community in terms of the, um, the culture, the ethnicity, um, and then also region. And we just got our notice that we were, we're we, we just did a, um, a recruitment for new, new board members. We brought in 12 new board members, and that was one of the things that, that you have to, that we considered during the uh, selection process, trying to get a, we had 50, 60 people who applied, and you gotta get big numbers to apply so that you can make a, uh, you could get a diverse selection. So you don't wanna just say, well, we need one of these and one of those and one of these, one of those. You got to make. You want to make quality decisions, so you need to bring in the big pools, and so you have to do it by the different groups. Um, we just got ours, and one thing we didn't have is somebody from Almador County. It was only makes up about one percent of our population, but now we're going to go out and look look in that county for a person. So it is one of the other things that we have to do. But all regional centers have to do that. Okay. Um, next question. I appreciate the stories and honesty shared by this panel. What type of trainings, if any, um, given in any of the language, the threshold languages to bilingual staff within your own agency? Uh, Let's take this one real quick. This one works. Hello. Okay, so we are at the regional center. We're actually providing the person center training for all staff. Um, not only are we providing the person center training for all staff, but we are building coaches and uh, leaders. So what will happen is uh, the leaders will actually start giving that training not only to our staff, but to the community, to our families. So yes, we are doing uh, we're providing cultural trainings. We're providing that person-centered training, which will help us listen to our clients, to our individuals uh, with disabilities, um, and hear what they what they want, hear what they want to live, what they want their lives to be like. Great. Um, next question is for Rapon. Um, your candor about possible reasons for the disparities is very much appreciated. We've heard many of the families in underserved communities rely on or relied on social recreation and camping programs, mm -hmm. and we have heard from Stephen how exactly how important those are and why they should be there. Um, so this is more of an ask than um, a question, and I feel like by now everyone knows where this is coming from. Um, the ARC and UCP California is asking the governor to fully restore social rec and camping and we ask that you take that back to the department and let them know how important that is um, and, and really carry that message for us. Uh, and, and, and I should say um, that that's a really, really important piece. Uh, you know, there's a great, there's, it's very complex, but it's a really important piece to begin to address some of the disparity issues. And I, I'll just add, to, so there is a, a bill that would restore um, those services. You know, we, we lost a lot of services back when the state was having a fiscal crisis back in 2008. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I think we're slowly but surely trying to restore some of those those services. We, um, as of January 1, lift the respite cap. Mm -hmm. um, and we knew that, uh, hearing from families, that respite was one of those services that um, that could possibly close that disparity gap. There's a lot of a lot of families, um, those families who um, have their children at home and not in residential facilities, use respite um, disproportionately more than families um, whose children are not in the home. So um, we're hoping services like that and hopefully the restoration of, of rec services um, can also contribute to this issue. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, you said there's good work being done in the communities. We heard about the good work at um, Valley Mountain Regional Center. In the communities where it isn't working well, why do you think that is? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't have a good name. The, the question is, uh, in the areas where it's not working well, why is it not working well?
Hello. I, the, but there's a disconnect. The families, again, are not included on the table. The very people that we're talking about, clients, parents, the disparity are not at the table. They're not part of, of the conversation, solution. And that's where the Justice and Equity Coalition is going to, to change that. But I'd like to uh, Tony answer that, add to that. Yeah, actually the, the same story was there. The w the we run across a, a lot of people who are just not uh, feeling that they're, they're welcome. They're not feeling that, uh, that uh, their voices are, um, are heard when they do speak up. And so, um, you know, that, that will continue to happen. The, uh, the, the point of this panel, too, is that you, you heard that big things on a large scale from the department are occurring. They're trying to, to put money into it and, and uh, shepherd many big projects across the state. You've heard then from Carlos what we're trying to do specifically in our regional center. But really, you heard on this side of the table that it's not enough and that the that that this the agitation needs to continue to keep pushing people like me and Carlos and Rapone and all of us that are trying to make a difference but that it doesn't happen automatically the money that that came up didn't just happen out of nowhere it wasn't something that all of us on this side of the table said hey how about let's address this problem it came because of the the community and the push that that helped so it's a partnership that, that you have to have both you have to have both sides, but that's what it, that's why it keeps moving forward. Otherwise, it doesn't move. All right, am I good? Am I out of here? No, 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 no not yet. <laughs> it's hard on this side. <laughs> okay. No, you you're on the hot seat a little bit longer, so just hang on. <laughs> um, Is that a whole stack of cards? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions. <laughs> Um, and I know I it's am now the one standing between uh, <laughs> cocktail hour and <laughs> so um, maybe I'm on the hot seat. But Harbor Regional Center in Southern California um, board has been uh, resistant to Latinos on the board. These are the inconsistencies we need to understand and why. <laughs> uh, I'm not touching that part unless you want to. <laughs> Well, I won't speak specifically to any board, but as, as Tony mentioned earlier, so we, we monitor the, the board's makeup. So we, we look at um, census data for all the catchment areas in the state, and we work with, with boards to ensure that their board membership mirrors that of their community. Um, there's been a lot of boards in the state who've, who've had a hard time um, honestly recruiting Hispanic um, board members with the with the change in demographics the number of Hispanic board members that need to be on a board has has increased and these are these are volunteer jobs or they're, they're non-paid jobs they're important important jobs um, but at the same time they're, they're they're time consuming so what we do is when we see that a board is lacking in any um, ethnic rep representation we ensure that that regional center that board tell us their plan to to recruit um, and as we go from board to board I, I always tell boards you know we've seen success stories we've seen where boards have have changed their 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 makeup and they've went out into the community they've they've spoken to parents of, of their consumers and encouraged them to join the boards and so we try to connect those boards who are um, having issues with with um, diversity on their board with other regional centers who've had success um, so if you know these boards and and they're looking for um, ways to to try to change or, or meet the, that criteria that's set by the state, then um, they can they can work with us. We can put them in in contact with other boards who've who've been successful at doing so. Tony, uh, just real quick here, I've got one. Uh, would it be better to make uh, rec programs more inclusive? Okay, inclusive. Yes. Very good. Okay. Yes. The answer to that question is yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Another and question was, how does one contact the Justice and Equity Coalition? And I guess Grace Huerta uh, and Mary uh, Gonzalez and, and Mary Lynn Lampe, if you can yes, contact uh, any of us. Yes, I believe uh, uh, Jordan has, uh, uh, he'll be a good contact person because we don't have an office. It's, it's, it's a coalition, but we all have our each uh, separate offices. But is that, Jor where's Jordan? Is that okay, Jordan? There you are. <laughs> so yeah, contact Jordan. 
Because it's different, yeah. Out. This it's a it's a tremendous group. I am really excited because this is going to make sure that the system we're talking about, the all the regional centers are going to be transparent, accountability. We're going to ask for records and outcomes. It's our it's our public right. It's our duty, and for us to have that information. So Tony, I might give your wife the last word here, but but I just want to put you on the spot. I want to put Mr. Rapone on the spot. And I want, as we look at what's going, where we're going in the future, you know, if, if I have a regional center, you know, and I have a son in the Golden Gate Regional Center, and if they have 17 case manager slots that they can't fill right now, and if we have inadequate uh, wages that we're paying your people, your, you know, just the, the people of the regional centers, and remember, this started with two regional centers. The Arc of San Francisco was one of those two. The other was in California Children's Hospital. We, we've got all the way to 21 now. And I don't know where all the money goes in one hand, but if we can't pay people enough, and then we can't, as providers out in the community, even find people to hire to be direct support professionals, whose fault this is, is the legislators. You need to stay on them, and all of us need to stay on our legislators to fund us. Yep, yep, yep. yep. There's no, no, denying, no denying that. We are all one community, and if we don't keep doing it, keep it up, this, this panel this morning, to make a full circle here. They they delivered that message that you know we have big wins. We all work together, work hard. That was actually a three-year campaign to try to get additional money in, the largest win you ever had. But that wasn't enough. That's that didn't fix everything. And what you're saying is completely true. The community is evolving. There are other people that are going to need help. They're going to need direct support professionals. The senior community is going to need the, the direct support professionals more and more. It's a bigger community with a very big, powerful voice. We're part of that, we gotta compete with that. So somehow, we all have to work together to continue to push on that. We hired 25 new people in my first year at the regional center, and the only impact I had on caseload was w by one person, because of our growth. The growth in our regional center is over 7%, in our early start was over 14%. It's a high growth area, but we didn't get a lot of money to do that, and all those people we added made a just a barely a, a move on uh, addr addressing the caseload ratio. If you don't have good caseload ratios, that will that messes the whole thing up. You can't move IPPs along to get the services, to get the ISPs done. Everything impacts people with disabilities and their families. So we're all in it together. Okay, last question, um, and it's to address to Carlos or anyone. Um, I am a rich, white, educated woman who runs a local advocacy organization as a volunteer in the Bay Area. We, talk about Im we talked about um, involving more Latino members, but we have no idea where to start. How do we fund our promotoras to encourage a broader range of parents to be able to be involved? Mary I'd be whoever it is, I'd be willing to talk to them. So a lot of this is just, uh, you know, re it's relationship building, right? Just doing what we can to be hungry to know each other and break down the walls between each other. So I'd be happy to talk to whoever that was if they want to just come up. Okay. Okay, the more important news is the reception is on the top floor of this uh, building, and uh, it's already started, so get on up there. We'll see you tomorrow. We're going to talk about crime against people with IDD, the state budget, and how it impacts us. It's going to be a great day. We'll see you tomorrow, and thanks for being here today. <laughs>